season. It's Jeremy Shaw and Brian Till to take you through the action. The Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America on IMSA Radio. On IMSA Radio. No better place to start the 12th season of Lamborghini Super Trofeo than right here, Sebring International Raceway, a racetrack that has it all. It has history, fast corners, slow corners, strategy comes into play here, drafting, you name it. What else does it have? Well, it has the bumps. Respect the bumps at Sebring is what everyone always says. Right now, a record field of Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evos about to take to the circuit. Sebring right in the heart of Florida, right in the center, and they have been racing sports cars here on this airport circuit since 1950. It is long, it is fast, it is bumpy, and you look at the names of some of the areas of this racetrack steeped in history. The other thing, good passing zones here. Turn seven, the hairpin, you can get it done there as you can under braking in turn 10, but what an interesting section of corners. 10, 11, and 12, 12, the tower turn, leaves you through Bishop's Bend, 15 and 16, onto the long back straight, and towards the sundown, down in turn 17, they call it Sunset Bend. Turn one, another one of those corners that is very, very challenging, and 37 cars and their drivers taking to the track. Welcome in, everyone. Brian Till, along with Jeremy Shaw, will have all the action for you. And Jeremy, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of it. Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America, what a great series. And it used to be a place for established drivers to come and have fun. They still do. But the field packed this weekend, and really over the last couple of seasons, I would say, with young guns looking to make their mark in sports car racing. Yeah, indeed so, Brian Till, and uh, there's a lot of young guns in this field, and there's also quite a few guys who have very, very little racing experience. 37 cars, so that is a record for this championship. As you say, it's, this is its 12th season of competition, so started in 2013. We've seen some great racing over the years, uh, and uh, all of the cars are identical. The Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2, uh, but we've got four different classes of drivers. We've got the pro cars, we've got five of those. There's 10 cars running in a pro-am category, 12 in am, and 10 in LB Cup, which is for drivers who have very little experience. And one of those drivers that should have been starting in LB Cup, Sam Shi, uh, did such a good job yesterday in his first practice sessions for what will be his first ever motor race uh, that he's been elevated already to the AM category. So there's a feather in his cap. He's originally from China, driving for Fly Flying Lizard Motorsports, which is also the pole sitter for this overall race overall. So watch out for him, for Sam Shi. He will start 15th in this race, and he'll start 10th for tomorrow's race, a tremendous run for him. On the overall pole position is his teammate, as I said, at Flying Lizard Motorsports, the vastly experienced Andy Lee in that very distinctive sparkle farts car number 14. Uh, can't miss that one, bright pink. And that will be the car starting from the pole position alongside him on the front row is a defending two-time series champion from Costa Rica. That's Danny Formal driving for Wayne Taylor racing with Andretti. And then on row two, a pair of Ansa Motorsports uh, young chargers. Brian, Bryson Morris will start fourth in car number 30. And Nico Jemin from France uh, will start in the third position in car number four. You talk about the experience that's in the field, Jeremy, and they're divided into different classes like you were talking about with Sam Shee. And for the fans, I think what's important to note is that every one of these Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2s is the exact same car. They haven't been adjusted for the different classes. It's just the driver experience and speed that separates them. And from the side of the racetrack or watching at home, you can tell which class car you're looking at. You see the color codes up at the top. There is a triangle in the windscreen up in front of the car. And there's also what I call a chiplet on the rear of each one of these Lamborghinis and color coded to tell you the class. That orange colors are pros, pro-am, yellow, am in green and LB Cup in blue. So look there along the windshield, upper right from the driver's standpoint, upper left, if you're looking at it as the car is coming towards you, it'll give you an idea of which class it's in. And I think the thing that's important, Jeremy, for some of these drivers without a lot of experience, even for those that have experience, you've got to be careful about who you're racing with. Know that you're after your own class win. 
Yeah, plus the fact there's another race tomorrow, so you want to make sure the car uh, <laughs> completes today's race and gets ready for, for tomorrow as well. But it's a massive field all lined up there behind that uh, safety car. And, uh, boy, this is going to be really interesting here. We had two clean uh, qualifying sessions. We've had uh, precious few incidents during the practice sessions. Either there were two practice sessions that took place prior to qualifying a little bit earlier on today. And, you know, it's, uh, it's been nice and clean. Let's hope we can keep it that way. Interesting. We talk about the different classes, two different classes of drivers up front right now. You talked about it. Andy Lee on the pole in a Pro-Am entry and alongside Danny Formal in the pro class entry from all defending champion in pro the field are coming around 37 cars a record field for lamborghini super trofeo north america and the 2024 season underway that is a magnificent sight as they all head down towards turn one. A nice clean start at the front of the field andy lee will have the advantage and in, uh, into second position from the uh, uh, from the second row is uh, Nico Jumin ahead then of the two-time def defending series champion Danny Formal. Great move there by nice. Jumin to move up to that second position. Team cars alongside. He was side by side with the 30 on the start. Bryson Morris aboard the number 30 from Ansa Motorsport. But you've got to let these hand cooked tires get up to temperature, up Ooh. to pressure, and a problem there in. Man, that is a big hit. Drivers left, and you can see a tire stuck on the rear wing of the number 10 as he has, looks like perhaps Graham Doyle had some contact, was moved to the outside, and two other cars. I don't know if this is a separate incident, but uh, another incident on the racetrack, the 48 involved, and I think the 11 involved as well. Yeah, Roman Davuti there, in car number 11, and number 48, that's Michael Starb, one of two brothers in this race. See if we can take a look what happened. By the way, Danny Formal did get himself back up ah, in the second position. There's a problem. Yeah, Graham Doyle just ran a bit wide on the exit there. Uh, just his second season of racing, the youngster from Clearwater in Florida. Uh, and uh, he's uh, just made a mistake there on the first lap, unfortunately. He had his... Uh, actually, it's his, it's his birthday today, in actual fact. March, March 14th, 06th, so his 18th birthday today. That's not the way to celebrate your, your birthday. So, unfortunate there for Graham Doyle. And a problem now for the 25 turned around in another section of the racetrack. And wow, you you put a curse on it, Jeremy. Yeah. You talked about how clean everything had been. And now we've gone full course caution, race control saying, hey, let's get this gathered up and under control. So we've gone full course caution. We'll get the field back together and several cars with issues. Yeah. That's the 13. Afir Levy has pulled his Lamborghini behind the wall as the AMR safety team heads out to the stricken number 10 of Graham Doyle. Yeah, I did speak to you too, didn't I? I feared this might happen. Two clean practice sessions this morning. Uh, I was thinking there was going to be incidents then. There weren't. It was nice and clean. But uh, unfortunately, first lap of the race, we got what, three or four different incidents, I think, out on a racetrack and uh, completed under full course caution. That's certainly unfortunate. Have another look here at Graham Doyle, just running wide there out of the carousel turn, gets uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the dirt a little bit and then kind of overcorrects and the cars, he's a passenger for them. And, you know, these cars have 650 horsepower. They are immensely powerful cars. And for drivers with very, very little experience, you just got to respect them. Uh, and I think uh, Graham just got a, bit, a little bit carried away there. Like I say, his, last year was his first season of racing. He's running in the LB Cup category, finished second in the LB Cup class. Moves, therefore, up to the AM for this year. Well, not therefore, but as a youngster, he will be moved up to AM, has been moved up to AM this year. And also going to be driving in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship as well. He made his debut in the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And we'll be driving also in the 72nd Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring on Saturday. Well, and easy to make that mistake. And Graham Doyle trying to get those tires up to temperature and pressure. And like we said, you're pressing hard coming around turn five there at Sebring. It's a long carousel, and you know that the car is going to track all the way out to driver's right, and you're going to let it go as far as you possibly can. Graham Doyle, I think he got on the curb first. Car kind of left up in the air and then landed off the racetrack just a little bit, Jeremy, like you said, and then it just snapped around on him. But he had such a promising season last year in his debut season. In the second half of the season, he was only off the podium once. So really learning and progressing very, very well. And as you said, also 
in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship as well as a third driver in endurance races. So he's on a trajectory to take him good places today, though not a very happy birthday for Graham Doyle. No, that's really a shame for him there. The, the, the car, it wasn't a, a, a super high impact there, so hopefully that car will be repaired again for tomorrow, but he's going to take a ride back in the AMR safety vehicle. What a great job all these guys and girls do at the AMR safety team. They're such a big part of this sport. Uh, not only in IMSA, but also, of course, in the NTT IndyCar Series as well. And uh, they uh, they do a, a tremendous job of making sure everything is safe and we'll get this race back underway again as quickly and as safely as possible. Andy Lee up front right now from the pole position. You look back at the start and really kind of surprised that Danny from All Falls victim. The two cars on the second row are both from Ansa Motorsport and... Man, Andy Lee with a good jump and going with him was the car that was directly behind him, Nico Jamin. Yeah. Jamin just takes advantage down into turn one, gets inside Formal, and off he goes. But Danny Formal, remember, knows how to win championships, Jeremy. He's done it two years in a row with Kyle Marcelli. Marcelli moves on to the WeatherTech Championship this year and focuses on that. And Danny Formal takes over as, let's say, the number one driver in the number one car, sharing that car with Ryan Norman this year. But... You wonder if he's just saying, hey, let's just be cool, calm, and collected because I've got to hand this car over to Ryan Norman during that mandatory pit stop. I want to make sure he's got some hand-cooked tires underneath him to do battle with at the end. That's a big key in this race because the uh, the rear tires uh, take a beating around here with 650 horsepower going through those rear wheels. It's rear-wheel drive, of course, these cars. And it's hot out there, too. It's uh, the, the pavement is pretty pretty warm. Uh, and the tires take a beating. So tire management is going to be very, very critical in this race and see who can keep those tires underneath them for the final stages of this 50-minute race. And as you say, there's a mandatory pit stop at some stage anywhere between 20 minutes and 30 minutes into the race. Uh, and that 10-minute window is have to, when you have to make your mandatory stop. In this race, we've got 37 cars. 20 of these cars are running with two drivers and 17 are running solo. The solo drivers will, will come in. They don't need to, to do anything. They just have to sit in their pits because there's a minimum pit stop time. This is, not about, this is not about a race in the pit lane. It's about a race on the race track. So the officials here are giving the teams plenty of time to come down pit lane, make your driver change, uh, get uh, the, the new driver, if you, if you change your driver, situated, and then on down the, to, the, to the pit exit and rejoin the race. There's a minimum time. It's uh, 88 seconds from the way they, from where they enter the pit lane to when they leave the pit lane. Uh, and for single driver cars, their pit stop has to be three seconds longer than the, the uh, dual driver cars. Reason for that, well, if, you, if you're driving this race solo, you'll be familiar through the first half of the race how the car is handling, uh, how the tires are performing, the balance of the car, all of that. Whereas if you're taking over at halfway through the race, it's going to take you a few corners at least to get up to speed and really figure out how that car is, whether it's changed the balance at all since the last time they were in the car, which we would have been qualifying a little bit earlier on today. So that's why there's that three-second discrepancy. And that's uh, uh, an interesting factor that we're going to have to watch during this race. Love looking down at the different spectator areas here at Sebring. Like I said earlier, since 1950, they've been racing here. This was originally a B-17 bomber training, training base that got turned into a public airport and then into a racetrack. And different configurations of the track over the years, it's changed a little bit. Certain areas have not changed at all. Basically, the front straightaway, the back straightaway, pretty much the same. Giant, thick blocks of concrete that made up the runways here. It doesn't matter what you do. You can never smooth them out, and hence the bumps, especially in turn 17. Airport's still active, and in fact, one of the runways active here this weekend. Planes in and out all weekend long. And uh, I saw yours over there, Jeremy, just a minute ago, one of the, the bigger jets over there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've, it's, I think it's safe over there. We should be fine. <laughs> well, you know, when the fans come from all over the world, that airplane that you're looking at right there, the red and white one, you saw the number on the back. It started with a C. They've come down from Canada. Not sure where these guys have come from, perhaps up from the Keys. And I think they brought some libations with them. 
I, I, why wouldn't you? I mean, look, this this racetrack, this event is uh, is legendary, isn't it? You know, the uh, the infield area there in Green Park. Uh, there's a it's a huge, fantastic party atmosphere here this weekend. Expecting the biggest crowd in the history of this race. Even when we got here, uh, well, yesterday morning was when I got to, got into the track here. What was that? Wednesday morning, and the place was absolutely almost jam-packed then uh, normally uh, it's busy but it doesn't get jam-packed until friday evening uh, getting you know, before the race ball well, this weekend there's just uh, there's so much enthusiasm here i've seen so many fans during the weekend are just loving the uh, the access they get of course to the imsa paddock uh, and with with all the all the your four events this weekend with the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, with the Michelin Pilot Challenge Series, five events, uh, the Porsches, the Lamborghinis, and the Mazdas. And I think there's 222 transporters with all the various cars and equipment for all the teams that are parked along, alongside the Ullman straight in the main paddock area. Uh, and it's just a, an impressive array of, uh, of, of teams, drivers, cars, you name it. And you can get into the paddock and have a look around. And I think that access is what drives a lot of the enthusiasm for IMSA racing. Well, and I think, you know, everything that goes on here, the concerts, the racing, the fan watching. Lawrence Welk may be here. I saw the bubbles just a minute ago. I'm showing my age because I actually know who Lawrence Welk is or was. <laughs> um, but it, it is just such a celebration. It is the spring break for motorsports. And you think about sports car racing in North America, kicking off at the Rolex 24. We saw a great weekend there. And all of the drivers in Lamborghini Super Trofeo just chomping at the bit to get on the racetrack. They had to wait until Sebring. It's been right at four months since the final, the world finals last year in 2023. And now back on track here this weekend. And nobody wanted to see this full course caution. They, they want to get back at it. And certainly the drivers that are in for this first stint, if they are in one of those two driver formats, they're not getting a lot of green flag running right now. No, that's right. And the, yeah, the window for the pit stops will open after 20 minutes and we're already uh, at, at 10 minutes. So uh, yeah, they, that's unfortunate for them. Yeah, most of the drivers in this race have done a fair bit of testing in preparation for this first race of the season. But I just bumped into Shian Chandra Soma, who won the uh, AM category a couple of years ago now running in a Pro-Am car, sharing number 21 car, that gold uh, decal car looks fabulous. Uh, he's sharing it with Nico Riga. It's running in the uh, 12th position right now, car number 21. And that's a brand new car for this for this season, run by the TPC Racing Organization. And unfortunately, they didn't get their car in time to do any testing. And Sheehan was just telling me the first time he sat in the car, first time he's driven a car of any sort since the World Finals, the end of last year in Italy, was yesterday. Yesterday, So he's got a pretty steep learning curve, but he looked pretty relaxed about it and ready to go. And he'll take over from that uh, from young Nico Riga for the second stint in this race in car number 21. Lights out on the Lamborghini or a safety car. Even a Lamborghini leads the field every single lap. It doesn't matter whether it's a race car or the Urus, right, Jeremy? Because you've got that beautiful safety car out in front. But lights out. We're going to go green this time by what's going through these drivers' heads right now, how to prepare for this restart. Yeah, well, I mean, for most of them, it was a nice, clean, clean start here. We've talked about the fact that the tires take a beating here. So uh, you want the tires to be able to last and have good pace in the closing stages of the race because that's when the points and the prize money uh, as handed out and the trophies. So you want to make sure, that, sure the car is good at the end. And for most of the people, particularly in the front 15, 20 positions or so, I think they were pretty respectful at the start, not pushing too hard on these tires uh, and make sure they've got plenty for the, for the latter stages. But now, you know, with uh, already uh, just that without a 30, 37 minutes to go, so we've already got 13 minutes in the books already. So you yeah, not about, about a quarter of the way through the race. Andy Lee up front in his number 14 from Flying Lizard Motorsports representing Lamborghini Newport. That's the other cool thing about the Lamborghini Super Trofeo Series dealerships involved in getting all these cars on the racetrack. And there's a championship for the dealerships as well. Andy Lee got to turn 17 and it is a long, long restart acceleration zone. You can go whenever you want, basically from the time you've turned into 17 or you can wait. There was no waiting on the part of Andy Lee. He was out of there, wasn't he? He saw uh, the opportunity to go, and he's he's done exactly that, trying to get a bit of a lead over Danny Formal heading into turn one, looking to the inside there of Jerome Blokemolen, 
it was uh, car number 77, that's Jake Walker, one of the pro entries. But uh, Jerome Blake Mullen, he's sharing that car with, uh, with Tim Pappas. Uh, those two have been sharing cars for a long, long time, for, for quite a while under the Black Swan Racing umbrella. This year they're running with Flying Lizards. Andy Lee with a good jump. That car is hooked up. It's a brand new chassis. They've done some testing with it. Tried to make sure they've gotten it kind of massaged on as you watch the front end of that 14 dive under braking into turn seven. On the brakes hard, anti-lock braking systems and the drivers use them. They'll brake right to them. Try not to stay buried in that ABS system too terribly much, but take advantage of it. And the traction control off the corners and you want that traction control set up to get that hand cooked tire its most bite, get you off the corner. A little bit of slip is one thing, but you don't want too much intrusion of the traction control. That's going to affect your drive off the corner. So right now, I would think that balance of the car is going to change a little bit, Jeremy, as we get more green flag running yeah, going here on it's this It's going to change quite a bit during this 50-minute uh, race, I think. So some of the drivers, they, they won't be too upset to have had that caution period in the early stages because we saw uh, through the practice sessions yesterday that after two or three laps, they, they really do tend to... Uh, fall off in terms of the performance of the tire nothing, not, nothing against the tire it's just you know that's the, the nature of this racetrack i mean it's always been pretty hard on tires and you've got to be you've got to be mindful of that uh, and so you know, you don't want to get that car tail happy too tail happy particularly near the stages of the race andy lee holds the point as the rest of the field streaming into 17 then danny from all nico jamin Bryson Morris, and then Ernie Francis rounds out the top five. Ernie Francis, new to Lamborghini Super Trofeo, certainly not new to sports car racing, multi-time Trans Am champion the last two seasons in open wheel racing in Indy Next, or NXT, and now into Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and he has really taken to this car and this format. Wow. Uh, as you would expect, Jeremy, right? Yeah. I mean, a very, yeah. very talented young driver. Indeed, there was a nice pass there by Nico Riga around the outside of Joel Miller at turn one. That was a ballsy move there, but side by side heading uh, past uh, my commentary position here at the start finish line and into turn one. Uh, and Nico Riga braved it around the outside. It looked like Joel Miller was going to try and make that pass back again. Wasn't able to do so. So a really good pass there by Nico Riga in that brand new TPC Racing Gold number 21. Different color, a uh, different uh, number this year, but same color. Yeah, love that bright gold car. And if Shihan Chandrasoma is in the field, you can be assured it is in that telltale gold. Lamborghini, as we've seen over the years. But like you said, great job by Rieger now setting his sights forward, trying to move on up. Rieger in the Pro-Am category. Four different classes right now. It's Formal who leads in Pro, but Andy Lee leads overall. He's in the Pro-Am entry. Vallas aboard the 34 in LB Cup, and McIntosh leads in Am. Yeah, so Rodrigo Valles, that's a nice job by him in that number 34 car for uh, TR3 Racing to get ahead of Naveen Rao, 24th position overall. But uh, meanwhile, all eyes on the front here. Danny Formal, he's, you know, he's, he's, not, uh, he's not putting any pressure on Andy Lee at the moment, but he knows, of course, that, you know, as you said earlier on, You've got to be mindful of who you're racing against. That's a pro-am car ahead of Daniel Formal. He doesn't need to worry about that in terms of championship points. He just needs to make sure he stays ahead of those two and some other sports behind him, Nico Jamin and Bryson Morris, the youngster, just 19 years of age from Mount Juliet in Tennessee, suburb of Nashville, making his debut in the championship this weekend. And for Bryson Morris, he's not only driving this Lamborghini, he's also driving in the Michelin Pilot Challenge in the Brian Hurdle Autosport Hyundai, a front-wheel drive TCR car. That's got to be a real challenge. I asked him about it yesterday. He said, yeah, I've got to be mindful of it because uh, this the Lamborghini is, is going about 30 miles an hour faster when he heads into turn one on each lap. Well, I would think, too, that the Lamborghini probably has close to three times the amount of horsepower that the Hyundai has that he's running in Michelin Pilot Challenge. And as you said, front-wheel drive versus rear-wheel drive a completely different animal now down into turn seven once again. Lee, you see the cars as they come into seven for mile now up to second. You see them as they come into seven a little offline, Jeremy, and then they move back over. That big bump in the braking zone still there in turn seven. The drivers all very much aware of it. Yeah, and uh, Bryson Morris, by the way, he just set the best lap of the race so far. Two minutes, 3.215, a couple of tenths quicker than our race leader, Andy Lee. He's got about a second in hand 
over Danny Formal at the moment. Then a three-car battle for second position. Number one is Danny Formal. Second, uh, right behind him is Nico uh, Germain in car number four, and then Bryson Morris in that car number 30. He's the fastest car on the track at the moment. And uh, for the Ansa Motorsports team, uh, Alan Nadal, a new look to the cars this season. Uh, new engineer there, Tim Neff, who's had a massive amount of experience in just about everything. And uh, clearly those cars are working very, very nicely. See there that bright orange number 88. We were talking about Ernie Francis a little bit earlier. He's trying to hold on to this train, but as you watch them come down the back straightaway, that bright pink number 14 in front, a Pro-Am entry, and then the next Pro-Am entry in the order is just behind the 88, and that is Jerome Bleekemol in aboard the 54. So right now, You've got to think for Andy Lee, he's thinking, all right, I see these cars behind me, that, but they really don't matter. Green is what matters to me. You see that car. It is the fourth, fifth car back in the order there. That is who the competition is for your leader, Andy Lee. But all those cars in between, it is go time for each and every one of them. And Danny Formal trying to pull out just a little bit from the number four just behind. Yeah, there is Jerome Blokemolen in the sixth position. They're second in Pro-Am. Uh, behind him is James, James Walker in another pro car and then another gaggle of pro-am cars. And one of those, that gold car we talked about a little while ago, Nico Riga, he's just made another uh, couple of positions over the last two laps up into ninth position now uh, as he uh, battles again with Joel Miller, who's trying to uh, get back past him. Actually, yeah. Uh, we talk he, about the talent. Position. Look at this. Lost one position there because number 64 car, that purple car, is uh, Luke Berkeley. He must have made a mistake in turn one, I think, Riga, because he lost that position to that purple car of Luke Berkeley. <laughs> Through turn five, six, and seven side by side, they're continuing to turn 10. And you would think Rieger is going to have the advantage when they get there. But Joel Miller trying to stay around the outside, side by side through 10. You don't see that very often. And Miller clears him. Great racing. We talk about the talent in Lamborghini Super Trofeo and how it has attracted more and more talented drivers over the years. You see it right there. Joel Miller, immensely talented, a former Mazda factory driver and prototypes. He knows how to get the job done at all levels of the sport does coaching, some stewarding as well, and some great respectful driving there by both of those drivers. And this is what we've come to expect over the last couple of years in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. True, but they were, they were kind of banging doors, weren't they, at one stage? On, uh, they, on that, they were right, banging. So. They were leading They were banging on doors, hey, Jeremy. I'm here, and I want past. And Joel Miller gets back past Nico Riga. So he's uh, up back now into what will be the... 10th position, I think, and the window is now open for pit stops. So I don't expect any of the leaders to come in this time around. Uh, Although, no, oh, uh, both Ansys cars are in. Yeah, indeed. Third and fourth place uh, teammates are both into the pit lane out of third and fourth. Excuse me, how much I know. So Kiko Porto will climb aboard the number four, and Loris Cabaru aboard the number 30. And these drivers will now have their opportunity. I would expect the drivers that are climbing out right now to immediately go get their helmet off, get on the headset, tell the drivers that are getting in what to expect. What kind of car do you have underneath you right now? What condition is the racetrack in? Because it's been a while since they've been out there and they're gonna wanna know how to get up to speed as quickly as they possibly can. Meanwhile, Andy Lee still laying down those lap times up front. Yeah, he is uh, consistent lap times as well. Uh, 2 minutes 3.4 last time around, 2 minutes 3.5 the previous lap, 2 minutes 3.4 the previous lap, 2 minutes 3.3 the lap before that. So uh, his last four laps in just within, uh, two, within two tenths of a second. That's exactly what you're looking for. That's what the veteran driver, some of Andy Lee's experience, is able to do. Well, and this is the time, too, if you've been in a battle on the racetrack and your competitors have come to pit lane, this is the time to lay down some laps, see if you can build up a little bit of an advantage right now on the racetrack. That's what Andy Lee is trying to do as, once again, Jerome Bleakmullen in the bright green 54 flashes by on the way into turn 16. Jake Walker is the first of the pro-class cars. He's running third right now, but he's the first of the pro-class cars, Jeremy, that is a single-driver format and he's going to have to sit for that extra three seconds on pit lane because of that, because of his track knowledge, and that single driver format, you alluded to it earlier, 
that minimum pit stop time three seconds longer for the single driver format. Yeah, and as we saw for Ryan Norman last year, that could be immensely frustrating because on several occasions last year, as Andy Lee stays out on a racetrack to complete his ninth lap, he will go as long as possible before handing over that uh, Pro-Am car to Slade Stewart, who has a lot less experience. Slade did win the LB Cup a couple of years ago, his first uh, proper season of racing, uh, but uh, Andy Lee will stay out there until, you know, until as late as possible, before that the 30-minute mark in this race, before handing over to Slade. The, the two pro cars behind him, Danny Formal and Early Francis Jr., uh, they can come in pretty much whenever they like because their co-drivers are both pretty quick. But Ryan Norman, who will share the number one car with Danny Formal, last year on several occasions he was running up front in the early stages of the race. Then he'd make his pit stop and his teammates, the number one, Danny Formal and Carl Marcelli, their pit stop would be three seconds faster. After that, Ryan would come out behind and unable to get back past again. So uh, he's got wise to that. He's got a, a co-driver for this year. Oh! Oops! It's Luke Berkeley running into the back of Joel Miller. Yeah. Yeah, and Joel Miller has really taken the attack to Luke Berkeley and coming down the straightaway into turn seven. Berkeley with a little bit of a block. Miller puts the car there, and then Berkeley just turned in. I don't know if he thought he'd cleared him or what have you, but the contact was made, and that may have caused damage or cut down a tire for Joel Miller, but the car did not look like it was well-balanced at all through turn 10. Indeed, the left rear down. Take a look. So Miller gets by, and then Berkeley just turns in. I think he must have thought that he was clear and he was going to drop in behind him, but that front splitter aboard the 66 makes the contact there, or with the 66 makes the contact, and Joel Miller now with a cut down tire. It's a long, long way around this racetrack to get back to pit lane. Yeah, that's very frustrating uh, for Joel Miller. He's uh, sharing that number 66 car with AJ Muss, the former uh, Olympic snowboarder, uh, who was so much looking forward to this race. Spoke to him just a few minutes before the start, and uh, he knew Joel was going to bring that car back into one piece, and he was looking to do exactly that in, in a good position. But through no fault of uh, Joel Miller, he's had that contact and that he's got to limp it back now and not cause any more damage to that uh, rear corner on the car. And that was a battle for position in Pro-Am. Berkeley got it, but it'll be interesting to see if the officials have anything to say about that. So they'll take a look at that incident down in turn seven and determine if there's fault to be handed out or a penalty to be handed out, I should say, as Ernie Francis climbs out and he'll hand over. Gianno Torino, another young driver, will be climbing aboard the 88, Jeremy. And talk about the young talent. You and I were discussing the lineup the other day and. I could come up with a handful of drivers, probably three or four of them that I could add together. Well, I won't say four of them, but three of them I could add together, and they still don't add up to what maybe careful, your or my careful, birthday would careful, be. Careful, careful, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, there's a whole bunch of teenagers in this race. You'd never have thought... That's what I meant, right? To, yeah, in top-level sports car racing, or this sort of level of sports car racing a few years ago, you'd very rarely expect to see teenagers out there, but there's a whole bunch of them here now, and there's a bunch of them in the WeatherTech race on Saturday as well. You know, and they, they see this as a legitimate stepping stone into that major series. That's why they're here. Some of them, quite a few of them, have started off their career perhaps in open wheel racing and now making the move across to sports cars. Others, though, uh, starting off in, uh, in, the, in the sports cars and going to try and work their way up to the top level of racing in this genre of car. I would expect to see Andy Lee in this time. He's only got about two minutes and 20 seconds to get to pit lane. And if you think about a lap around this racetrack, it's about 2.03. They're going to be cutting it really close if he stays on the racetrack. And he's catching cars who have just come out of pit lane. Indeed, Andy Lee now into the pit lane. Yeah, so there he comes. And uh, I would expect Jake Walker most likely to follow him in, in second position. Yes, indeed. So the number four, uh, 14 car, the leader onto pit lane. Number 77 follows him in. Uh, the only other cars that haven't yet made a pit stop, I think number 64, yeah, he's in two. That's Luke Berkeley after uh, serving that, uh, well, after being involved in that incident with uh, Joel Miller. The uh, incident involving car number 66 and 64, that is Joel Miller in 66, 64, Luke Berkeley, is under review in race control. 
You know, contact is one thing, Jeremy, but when it damages another car, that's when the yeah. officials really start to get involved with it. If, if the car goes around, loses positions, or there's damage to it, and it impedes their ability to stay at speed, that's when the officials really want to have a close eye on it. Was it just a racing incident, or was it something a little more that needs to be penalized? They'll take a look. They'll make that decision as we continue to watch the cars now finish pit stops well, and then back onto the circuit. That was number 57 car of Nick Grote, another newcomer to this sport, uh, making serving a drive-through penalty for he uh, exceeded the, the speed limit in pit lane by six uh, kilometers per hour. Uh, so th these cars have a pit lane speed limit pit lane speed limiter which you act the driver activates with a button on the steering wheel but if you don't press the button then it's not going to activate uh, and uh, i think just uh, you know, there's lots of lots of things to play with on these steering wheels in this in these cars they're very sophisticated race cars and and uh, but ultimately they're down to the uh, the driver pressing the right button at the right time and uh, he's just served that drive through penalty so he's back in in the fray again having already I think made his, what, his mandatory pit stop, but that'll be his second stop for number 57. That's going to take a lap or two for the order to kind of shake out and get us back to where we can really determine who is where. Slade Stewart, though, we know now behind the wheel of the number 14 that he loves so dearly. It was his family that came up with this paint scheme, his daughter, and he runs it proudly and has really gained a lot of attention. So Stewart now underway and really kind of came on with his game last year. As you said, was the champion in LB Cup a couple of seasons ago, moved up last year into Pro-Am, and it's really stepping into much deeper waters. And I think a lot of times for these drivers without a lot of experience, Jeremy, stepping into a Pro-Am class is really, really good Good for their advancement. Now they're paired with a pro driver who's not just coaching them from the outside. They're driving the same car. They can compare data on the weekends, and it really, really helps a lot of these drivers improve much more quickly than they would if they were in a series that was just a single driver format. Absolutely true. Yes, and uh, you know they, these cars, uh, they are sophisticated. They've got full onboard data systems. There's a lot of really accomplished race engineers in the paddock here as well in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. So there's a lot that these drivers can draw from both in terms of their driver coaching and also the data that is produced from the car from which they can analyze their performance and find more speed. Ryan Norman now on board the number one Wayne Taylor racing yeah. with Andretti in but, third right now. There were only three drivers who won in the pro category last year. Kyle Marcelli and Danny Formal, obviously they were in the same car. The only other driver to win in pro was Ryan Norman and he too was with that same team. He now shares that car with Danny Formal, but this car just doesn't seem to have the balance that I've seen in the past. There were races last year where Formal and Marcelli made it look easy. But they've had their hands full, I think, really kind of all weekend long here. They've led a couple of sessions, been up front, and obviously run third right now. But something on those pit stops gave the advantage to the two Ansem Motorsports entries because the four and the 30 out in front, Porto and then Cabaru, they have leapt to the, to the top on those pit stops. And you see the number one, Ryan Norman, back in third as he heads around and down towards the hairpin. Yeah, so uh, the the minimum pit stop time for the uh, two driver cars is, where is it? for two drivers is 84 seconds. Yeah, 84 seconds. So just look at their pit stop time here. It looks like they're they're outside of that, so they should be okay, uh, I believe. If uh, if they if they are short on their minimum pit stop time, then they'll have a a time penalty added at the end of the race, which is somewhat a bit, sometimes a bit confusing. But yeah, great stops there by uh, by the two answer cars. It's Kiko Porto who now leads uh, in car number four. Uh, the young Brazilian, 20 years of age, very impressive young man is Kiko. And he uh, is a former champion in the USF 2000 Championship. He won that uh, a couple of years, 2021 actually, and raced the last couple of years very impressively in the next step on the open wheel ladder this year though seeing an opportunity to join the sports car ranks and he did a brilliant job in qualifying this morning for the second race he will start on the pole position in car number four will kiko porto said a, a lap time right at the end of the session when it, which in itself is impressive because they have to run 
the, the same set of tyres through both of the qualifying sessions. So it had run for a full half an hour before he set that time. And right in his wheel tracks is Loris Cabaru, Cabaru, his teammate, another 19 year old who's taken over from Bryson Morris. And two young drivers turning to the sedan based or GT based series to say, hey, this is how I want to move up my career and further it. As you saw, the number 14 of Slade Stewart drop behind the 77. Not unexpected to see that. Jake Walker behind the wheel of the 77. That young man experienced here running in the pro category. So we expect to see passes like that and Slade Stewart to drop back just a little bit. I'm wondering if the number one had a little bit of a lengthy pit stop, Jeremy, but I don't have to wonder about the 64 and 66. There was a penalty handed down for incident responsibility there with that incident with Joel Miller. So the 64 will have to serve a penalty. And also coming in, Car number seven, a penalty, a short pit stop. He'll have a drive through, as will the 32 for a short pit stop. So, so not at all uncommon to see this at the first race of this season, trying to make sure you're getting all that process down right. But if you get it wrong, you're going to pay a price. Yeah, when I said there's to be a time penalty, if you're within, a, I think it's a second of the, minimum, a second, yeah, of, the, of the minimum time. If you're within that, it's just a time penalty of three times what the, uh, the the margin is between what you should be and what you actually made for your pit stop time. If you're more than a second outside of it, then it's a drive-through penalty. So that is the case then for number uh, 32, which is uh, Naveen Rao, who is actually leading in LB Cup. So that's a significant penalty for him. And also car number seven, which is Alexandra Lima, who's running fifth in LB Cup. Right now, an intense battle through turn 16 and on to the back straightaway, the bright red number one. That's the defending championship team with one of the defending championship drivers, Danny Formal, aboard this weekend. But right now, Ryan Norman behind the wheel. And right behind him is the number 88, Gianno Torino, another one of those young guns, Jeremy, that we've watched over the last couple of seasons. Torino really doing a good job with getting the job done. And I'm going to say again, I just don't think that the number one from Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti has the balance that they've had in years past. I expected to see a little bit more of them come race time or out of them, I should say. And the performance just isn't there like we're used to seeing. It's not, is it? And uh, just look at lap times for our race leader, Kiko Porto. Uh, one minute, 4.8 last, uh, two minutes, 4.8, excuse me, last time around. And the gap between first and second, just over a second. There's a spin there. Oops. Somebody else Oops. thinks that's a good idea. I'll do the same. That's coming out of uh, turn uh, 15, 16. 16 onto the back straightaway. That's the 32. Oh, that that's Naveen Rao again then. So he, still right I now. don't think he served his penalty yet. So he's, he was probably trying to hustle back to the pit lane to serve his penalty uh, for the uh, short pit stop time. But now he's losing a lot of time stuck in the uh, on the exit of the corner there of turn 16. Let's have a look. See. See. Whoa. And we talk about traction control, Jeremy. Yeah. It looks like perhaps just not on a high enough setting, but it's still, you can't fix physics. And then Rao comes in there. I think he sees the slower car, the 98 that is spun. He's probably already begun his acceleration. And when he sees that car sitting there, he lifts abruptly off the throttle because he's closing in on a car that's well off speed. And when he does that, it upsets the balance and around he goes. Around he goes, yeah. So uh, resetting the race then now, we've got the five pro cars at the front. Number four for number 30. They're pulling away from Ryan Norman in third position. Doesn't seem to have anything to, for those two Anson Motorsports cars at this stage in the race, certainly with only with less than 13 minutes remaining. And Ryan Norman instead has, has his hands full with Gianna Trino for TR3 racing right behind him in car number 88. Uh, then a bit of a gap back to uh, Jake Walker then. We've got five Pro-Am cars in a row. So we see number 32 on Naveen Rao serving that penalty. That's going to drop him out of the lead. Uh, uh, of LB Cup and handed over to Mark Brummond, who's running for Auto Technic Racing. That t one of the teams making its debut this weekend, number zero two car. And there goes Kika Porto again. Nice consistency at the front of the field. 204.3 last time around. He's lapping nicely in the uh, mainly in the, in the low four, uh, two minute four second range and just fractionally quicker than Loris Cabaru, uh, who's racing this year also in the. Lamborghini Super Trofeo Europe, the, uh, the young Frenchman, two 19-year-olds then, uh, uh, Cabaru and Bryson Morris sharing that number 30 car. 
What I see right now, Jeremy, when I look at the leaders up front, Porto aboard the number four as he leaves turn seven, his teammate just behind. I see two very well-balanced cars. One of the things I'm looking at is the platform and how it moves smoothly with the bumps. When we get over to 17, we'll find out just how good that platform is, correct? But the car looks to be very docile underneath them. It's not like it's a pogo stick, stiffly sprung and all that. You, you need a car around here that's got some stiffness to it so that it holds up through the, some of the higher speed transitionary areas of the racetrack, but it also needs to put the power down and it needs to be subtle over the bumps. And right now, I think Ansa has done a good job with that, but a problem for the number 12, that is turn 17. He's made contact yeah. with the tire wall on the outside. I don't see a lot of damage to the car. There is some damage, the rear wing askew. So Back Deja, underway, and we'll see if they can get straight to pit lane. Deja vu from yesterday, unfortunately, with a different corner. That's Tony Bullock in car number 12, a former winner in the uh, prototype uh, challenge, uh, IMSA prototype lights championship from 10 years or so ago. Been out of racing a long time, making his return this weekend with one motorsports. So he just carries a bit too much speed into the corner, gets onto the dirty part of the racetrack and spins it around. Yesterday's incident was in turn one. That one motorsport team got that car repaired again, and I spoke to Tony this morning. He was somewhat chastened by that spin yesterday, and uh, you know his confidence certainly took a, a beating after that. And, uh, unfortunately, this isn't going to do his confidence any good either, is it? And this is, but this is what I like about this racetrack, Jeremy. Look to the outside of the tire wall that he makes contact with. There is a massive space before the next tire wall. And I think it's one of the things Sebring has done so well, and that is the safety, especially in the high speed areas of the racetrack. If you were to lose your brakes and have a high speed contact with that tire wall at the outside, it moves the entire wall across a pretty open area of, of concrete before it gets to the next safety barrier. All of that dissipates massive energy and it makes turn 17 so much safer than it's been in years past. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's uh, th There have been so many improvements, as you say, over the years here. And uh, it's uh, yeah, that was a, a relatively light impact there for uh, the number 12 car of Tony Bullock. But, uh, yeah, it, it's unfortunate for him to have two incidents in the same weekend. But, you know, he's, he knows it's a long season. He'll be back. And uh, he's got a good, good head on his shoulders, lots, you know, lots of experience earlier. In, in life, perhaps, he might have been out of sport for, for quite a bit of time, just done some club racing uh, over the last 10 years or so, but he'll be back. He was he was showing some very, very good pace yesterday before that incident. That's number 12 car then back underway. And we saw Sam Shee with the spin earlier in turn 16, right here where Bullock yeah. is going through in the number 12 onto the back straightaway. And think about Sam Shee. He, this is his first auto race, yeah. and it's in a 650 horsepower, 150, 160 mile an hour Lamborghini, and a problem for the 66 off. Not exactly sure where that is because shot kind of tight, but gets it turned around and then back underway. And you know, it's a handful. AJ Must behind the wheel of the 66 sharing that car this weekend with Joel happen, Miller, it? and it's kind of been through the battle. Let's see if we can see what happens to our former Olympic snowboarder. Yeah, I think he just lost it under braking. Okay, he's uh, looking to go inside another car. There's a contact yeah. between the two. Yep. Yes, that's 22 is uh, Courtney just... Crone uh, driving that car for world speed. Uh, she's making her debut this weekend. It was uh, Scott Huffeck who drove the opening stint in that car, and uh, she didn't see AJ must uh, poking his nose down the inside. Not sure AJ was really quite close enough to make that move, to be perfectly okay. honest. I don't think you can really blame Courtney for that. Uh, and uh, AJ will get that car back on the way. So it's been an eventful day for that number 66 car. That was a car that was uh, hit earlier on by Luke Berkeley, uh, whose, whose co-driver, uh, who is Garrett Adams, making his debut as well this weekend, had to serve the drive through penalty for the incident responsibility that was caused uh, by Luke Berkeley. But, uh, you know, he's, he's, yeah, he's had an eventful race, but he's still going there uh, and in the top 10 in the Pro-Am class. And Jake Walker is going to have time added to his pit stop. That's one of those pit stops less than a second short, so there's a multiplier that goes with it, as you said. And the 0-2 will also have a time penalty at the end of the race for a short pit stop, that same multiplier being applied there. Up front right now, though, Kiko Porto above aboard the number four, I should say, not above it, I hope. And then the 30, the teammate just behind, Ansa Motorsport really doing a good job to get a handle 
on this racetrack right now. Good cars underneath those two drivers. A problem for a car over in turn 15 and the 23 with an issue as yeah. well. That That's Chris Tasker there, Chris Tasker, uh, who uh, in that Fly Alliance Lamborghini, uh, he's, uh, he's doing a nice job. He was fourth in the LB Cup class. Again, a guy with uh, very, very little racing experience. Uh, gets it underway again without any uh, any major dramas, but he's going to give up that fourth position in the class. And it's, it's a, a very similar problem to what we've seen with other cars. It looks like turn in is okay, and perhaps right about throttle application, you lose it a little bit. And, and you may be wondering, well, how can that happen? It's got traction control. Well, it does have traction control. The traction control also does not work. It's not stability control. It is literally, it won't let the rear tire spin. Stability control helps balance the car with kind of offset braking on different corners and such. That is not what's on this car. It's literally just don't put the power down and spin the rear wheels. So if you turn in a little too fast and come off the throttle, there's no stability control that's gonna help the car at that point. And if you have the traction control turned down a little too much, and get your foot in that 650 horsepower before you've got the grip to accept it, either one of those scenarios, you're going to go around. You are indeed, and particularly in the later stage of the race, we talked about earlier on, these rear tires take a hammering. Uh, in uh, 50 minutes racing around here in pretty pretty warm conditions, uh, you are going to lose traction on the back end of the car, and that's something you know, the more experienced drivers will be able to cope with for lesser experienced drivers like Christopher Tasker, it's kind of a new thing for him, particularly to be running up there in the fourth place in the class. He was doing a really, really excellent job there. But, um, you know, he's, he's, he'll learn from that and he'll come back stronger tomorrow. Now he's got a, a big cheering section here. I don't think his wife's here, but he's, his wife's, they're expecting uh, a baby a, a baby fairly soon. So he's he's all excited about that. But I think right now he's concentrating on his driving. Meanwhile, at the front, these two answer cars are kind of checking out from the third place car and Ryan Norman in fact last time around was overtaken for that third position by Gianno Torino in car number 88. Again watching these two over the bumps will be interesting to watch turn 17 here. He's talking about how compliant these chassis look and for 20 year old Kiko Porto what a great job he has done that transition from open wheel to GT racing. I would say it's been highly successful at least to this point watch the car through yeah. there they're solid jeremy look at yeah. that it is a nice smooth ride everybody's going to want to know what the shock package is that ansa well, has on the 40 oh, on the four and the 30. yeah it's I mean, everybody runs the same shocks in these series but uh, tim neff has more experience on it with shock absorbers than just about anybody else he's the new race engineer for ansa motorsports this season a new look new colors on the cars new engineering staff there with uh, tim leady and these two young drivers are doing a fabulous job out front there and kiko porto this is not his first uh, sports car races and a couple of races in brazil including a race at the end of last year on the uh, goiana it was a, a nascar brazil race uh, in a stock car and it, I mean, it was on a kind of a modified oval a very f a flat oval at goiana <laughs> with, with with no banking on at either end of the track he won that very impressively and he's doing a fabulous job here transitioning to the to the road course at Sebring, which is a track, of course, he knows very well from all the testing he's done in the open wheel ranks earlier in his young career. Yeah, and when you talk about testing here, whether it's IndyCar drivers or drivers on that ladder system in the open wheel area, this area of the racetrack that we see Kiko going through right here, this is part of the test circuit. They run what they call the short circuit, but as they come out of tower here, they're not going to go down through Bishop's Bend. In fact, just about right there, you see the track turn off to the right. They're going to make a right-hand turn, rejoin at what we call turn three on the long course. So this area of the racetrack is one that they don't get to drive through, and certainly turn 17 is an area of the racetrack that they don't drive through. True, but he's raced on the long circuit here uh, as well. And uh, they, as you can see, they pulled away well away from Gianna Trina now in third here? position. What has happened here? The four dropped back behind the 30 for just a moment through no, the turn 15 six. Is that a lap car? Yeah, in between the two of them, yes, it is. It's okay, there you go. Scared livery, me for a moment. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly right. No, it's uh, Porto who still leads. And just looking back to the Pro-Am class, sixth position overall, uh, Nick Persing in car number eight, who shares that, uh, that car with... Uh, uh, Nate Stacey, who drove the opening stint of this race, that's another WTR with Andretti Wayne Taylor Racing Andretti uh, entry. 
He's leading the Pro-Am class, got a big lead now over Tim Papp, who's done an excellent job uh, taking over from Jerome Blekemol and second in the class, but he's under increasing pressure now from Patrick Liddy in car number 72. Uh, Patrick has taken over from uh, Blake McDonald, who drove the opening stint in that Forte racing entry. White flag is out. The orange on the lap car had me, yeah. <laughs> it kind of took me aback because the 30, a very similar paint scheme, black and orange, the, the car that they were going past was gray and orange. So yep. kind of took me aback there because we just had kind of a slight shot at it as they were going through 15. So oh, I can't find, yeah. catch my breath there yeah. and see the number eight of Persing who leads in the Pro-Am category and really not pressured at all through this uh portion of the race he's really kind of has it all his way he, he does yes absolutely right so he's got a, a big lead there so he's just going to kind of bring it home here as he has have these two answer boys out in front uh, 20 years of, of age then is Kiko Porto 19 only is Loris Cabaru who's going to be a busy boy going back and forth across the Atlantic this season both doing the Lamborghini Super Trofeo both here in North America uh, where he's racing for the very first time and in Europe as well It'll be interesting, too, because all of the racetracks that Cabaru faces this year, he will not have had time on, as you say, racing in the United States for the first time. For Nico Porto, though, and teammate Nico Jamin, what a great weekend this has been, at least through the first half of it. These cars underneath them all weekend long. A great job in qualifying to start on the second row. And for Nico or Kiko Porto, out of turn 17 for the last time, a dream drive at Sebring International as he claims the win in race number one in the pro category in 2024. Welcome to Lamborghini Super Trofeo. Yeah, what a great run there uh, by uh, by the youngster. Uh, he's uh, he's a real talent. He's, he's got a great bit of personality as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's got a big future ahead of him, no doubt about it. That's Kiko Porto in that car. What happened to... Loris Cabrero in the last lap, did he fall right back? Because it's shown as Gianno Torino taking a second position. I thought the two answer cars were together going into the final corner, weren't they? I thought they were as well. But as you watch the eight, Nick Persing comes along. Nate Stacy, he and his teammate, Nick Persing, take the victory there in the Pro-Am category, in the Am category, looking at oh, the minute, 27 out in front right now. But... Yes, there what must, happened no, to Cabaru? I'll tell you what happened. There must be a penalty of some sort to the number 30 car because uh, if you add up his times, he's got, I think he must have had a 10 second penalty for something. I didn't see it uh, show, showing up anywhere on the scoring screen, but that's what, uh, what happened because he took the checkered flag in second place, Cabaru, but he's lost it. Uh, I don't know what for, but it's going to be Gianno Torino for TR3 racing that takes second position in car number 88. A little bit farther back uh, down the field. That's the 0-2 car of Mark Brummond for Auto Technic Racing. He's running in the 23rd position overall, and uh, he's just got uh, one corner to go before he can take the checkered flag to win the LB Cup for the first time. Understand the penalty for the 30 was at the start. So you have to go way back to the beginning when Bryson Morris was behind the wheel at the start must have pulled out a line before the start finish that's a no-no the penalty comes at the end and now checkered flag falls on brumman who takes the victory in lb cup so all four of our class winners have crossed the line great racing here and we'll tell you for ansa motorsport you look at that victory that they had and the performance of the 30 because still bryson morris and loris cabaru come home with a podium finish but the dominant performance was with the ANSA team here today. We'll see if any of the other teams can rebound. What do they have for tomorrow, Jeremy? You still have time to make those adjustments. You do indeed, but Kiko Porto will start from the pole position after that brilliant, brilliant run at the end of the uh, second qualifying period earlier on today. So uh, as we can see, the performance of those cars through this race was really consistent. Very, very impressive. And uh, he's going to be starting from the preferred position at the front tomorrow, uh, and it'll be... Uh, Ryan Norman, who will start second for tomorrow's race in Carnival, and he had to settle for fourth place today for himself and the two-time de defending series champion Danny Formal. 
Taking a look at the unofficial results. Once again, Porto and Jamina up front in the pro category, then in pro am. Persing and Stacy, a good driver pairing. We saw strength with those two last year, yep. and they have continued right where they left off. So with a victory here in Pro Am. Then Dobson aboard the number 27, the solo drive there for Ken and Forte Racing. They'll take the victory in the AM category. And then back in LB Cup, well back in the order is Brumman aboard the 0 2 as you look at the rest of the order right there. 37 cars, a record field for Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America in the 12th season for this series here. And, man, the racing is what I expected, Jeremy. It's busy, and this is a racetrack that will take its toll on you. Saw some great, great driving, some respectful driving, and a couple of hiccups here and there, but that's to be expected here with the diversity of driver experience and talent that you have. Yeah, fair comment. I mean, all the instances were early on or a few later on, but nothing of any significance. It went green all the way after that uh, early full course caution. And uh, hats off there to uh, Kiko Porto and uh, Nico Jamin for the overall win. Nick Percy and Nick Stacey in Pro-Am. Brilliant job there by Ken Dobson making his return to racing after a lengthy absence to take the AM category in uh, in Carnival uh, 27, a really good run uh, for him in the uh, Forte Racing entry. And then in LB Cup, again, it's Mark Brummond who comes away with his first victory uh, in the class uh, with John Hirschberg, also for, for, well, for Forte Racing in second place, only about three seconds behind him. You saw Loris Cabarou moving up to the door of the number four and congratulating Kiko Porto on his victory and that's why you come here it's what lamborghini super trofeo north america has built itself into over the last couple of years a come a place to come and impress those that you want to help you in your career and for kiko porto nico jamin that's exactly what they did with the overall victory here today there's more coming from the weekend though race number two tomorrow afternoon Make sure you stay with us. We'll see you there. For Jeremy Shaw and Brian Till, we'll catch you tomorrow from Sebring. This program is a Radio Show Limited production. For more, check imsaradio.com and subscribe to IMSA Radio wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, bud.